All right. And hello, everybody. Today we'll be talking about abstract expressionism and pop art. And um, this is live from quarantine, my first ever video lecture. I'm just kind of making a little note for fun, for any future use. It's a Friday. It's snowing outside, and I've just gotten over the coronavirus myself as we all uh, sit here in the unknown. Un un Got to think that this is a, a time that we'll all remember. Um, but moving right along, we'll kind of jump into a little bit of popular culture to warm up to pop art with The Simpsons. So excited to do something cultural together. That ring, what's he doing in a museum? He can barely draw. Ow! Oh no, I'm being erased. Move it, bub. We got an installation to installate. Mm, a class Oldenburg. He's a European who defied convention and embraced American popular culture. He must be a hundred feet tall. Now this is a Joseph Turner. In an era when everyone else painted portraits, he broke away by painting the Venetian canals. It's glorious. The streets are paved with water. You could ride a walrus to work. And Picasso started out painting realistically, then moved on to cubism. By the end of his life, he was just painting crank letters to the editor. They call it his angry jerk period. Oh, let's see. <gasps> With him! Any ideas yet? No, these guys are geniuses. I could never think of something like soup or a pencil. Oh, I'm just going to rest for a minute. Hasta la vista, baby. Soup's on, fat boy. Oh! 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 No! No! Oh! No! Andy, no! Huh? Art. Oh, why does Art hate me? I never did anything to Art. Uh, let's get out of here. All right, so starting off with just a little bit of fun. First, we got to kind of dig into some abstract expressionism. I'm going to see kind of where pop art came from. And something we always kind of want to keep in mind is how each art movement's responding to the one before it. So abstract expressionism developed in New York City in the 40s and 50s. It is a term that is really meant to encompass not only the work of painters, fill their canvases with fields of color and abstract forms, but also those who attack their canvases with a vigorous and gestural expressionism. And we'll also see how this changed um, the ceramic world as well. And um, we kind of think about this as like action painting and um, we'll see kind of this action uh, way of working sculpturally. So there's a couple of terms that we really want to kind of um, start grappling with here. And, and the term abstract itself might be something we're all a little more familiar with. Um, it's, you know, it's art that does not attempt to represent um, something, you know, like a perfect, just uh, like a, a perfect representation of something. Um, but representational abstract forms are something, you know, they hold, uh, inspiration and visual references to something, whereas non-representational abstract works are something that do not begin with a thing or uh, a, a subject from which, you know, the the abstract painting or sculpture is formed. Instead, it is nothing, right? So, um, what the artist's intent is uh, is just exactly what they are doing, and and the viewer interprets it as. Um, so we'll kind of get into, um, you know, that, we'll dig into that term a little bit more with the abstract expressionists and um, the color field painters as well. And we'll just kind of take a look and take note of different styles of artists working in this field. Right? So kind of free of any representation.
So artists were committed to the idea that um, art is an expression of the self. It's born out of profound emotion and universal themes. So most abstract expressionism is really shaped by surrealism, and they translate some of these ideas of kind of mining the subconscious into a new style to fit the post-war mood of anxiety and trauma. And we can kind of see uh, more of a, a connection to the kind of, you know, art and um, personal well-being and meditation and kind of working through ideas um, free of representation. And this is, this is kind of a nice quote um, ta talking about this. And different times require different images. Today, when our aspirations have been reduced to a desperate attempt to escape from evil, and times are out of joint or obsessive subterranean and pictographic images are the expression of neurosis, which is our reality. To my mind, certain so-called abstraction is not abstraction at all. On the contrary, it is the realism of our time. They're really kind of acknowledging these um, kind of deep personal um, ways of working through ideas in an entirely abstract way as being kind of privileging that as, as being important. Abstract Expressionism is a painting movement that developed in the late 1940s and early 1950s in and around New York. Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Lee Krasner, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, Adolf Gottlieb, Norman Lewis. How do all these people come together in New York at this time. And somehow somebody had to make up a word for this kind of painting that's trying to point to something like really big. It's not landscape painting, it's not history painting, it's not genre painting, like it's a new kind of painting. It is resolutely abstract by which I mean abstract expressionist canvases do not try to make images of things as they exist in the world. I think it's easy to kind of look at abstraction and say, well, it's abstract, so it's all the same. But in fact, the work is quite different from artist to artist. <laughs> Abstract Expressionism as a movement was extraordinarily fortunate to have two very important and influential critics, Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg. Rosenberg and Greenberg came at the material from very different positions. Clement Greenberg's account of Abstract Expressionism had a strong philosophical bent to it. He was interested in ideas of truth and beauty and purity. And one of the ways Greenberg translated those kinds of philosophical ideas was to see abstract expressionism as working through the purity of the medium of painting. By that he meant that painting was no longer involved in creating an illusion of the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional canvas. Rather, Abstract Expressionism was involved in exploring the limits of painting's two-dimensionality. This means that often the paint is applied in a way that lets you see as the viewer how it was applied. So with Pollock, you understand that the painting has been dripped off a stick or a brush. With Franz Klein, you understand that the brush has been moved in a gesture. You, as a viewer, have a very strong awareness of the process that went into making the work. Harold Rosenberg came at abstract expressionism from a much more experiential point of view. He somewhat famously 
imagine the canvases as a kind of arena within which the artist was acting. Harold Rosenberg had an idea that painting in the kind of context of Jackson Pollock was not something that was a kind of premeditated idea. What he's saying is that that whole activity of making, of being in the zone of creativity, physically, emotionally, intellectually, is the real meat of the matter in an Abex painting. There's a lot of action, but then like, what's behind this? What's the human experience? And then that's what the abstract expressionists are trying to get at. It's kind of a nice video there for some experts and just a uh, quick quick look through a few more of these abstract expressionists. Um, and we'll see just a quick video of Pollock working, um, just so you can kind of see, you know, the action there. And these drip paintings, which Pollock began producing in the late 1940s until he died in 56, became one of the most original bodies of work of the 20th century, um, which is pretty significant. And although they may not, you know, we might not view them as kind of brown, groundbreaking, uh, today I always want us to remind us to make sure we're looking at the work um, in the time period in which it was created, right? And at this time, this was pretty revolutionary. Um, the, the idea that even that the painting could come off of the easel and placed on the floor and worked from above, um, that alone was a pretty um, significant leap, let alone making something that was entirely abstract and had absolutely no um, kind of representation. So um, at times the work could suggest an anxiety and the entrapment of the body and the mind as well. Um, so we, you know, as I kind of mentioned, we might think of this work as really being um, something about, you know, personal well-being and working through some of those feelings. Just so we can all see the see it in action.
it's a little cool symbolic here. It doesn't make much difference how the painting is put on as long as something has been said. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. Or just another here. So um, Clement Greenberg, uh, like the kind of one of the principal critics that they mentioned in that video, is, uh, you know, right, it's influential there in the 20th century supporting express, abstract expressionism such as um, Pollock. I mean, you pay close attention to the formal properties of art, like color, line, and space. You might not maybe expect this when you look at um, Pollock's art as it, as, as, you know, it's kind of one of the critiques is it, it's just kind of a mess. Um, and, uh, and people kind of criticize Pollock as well for his kind of drinking and smoking uh, while, you know, creating. Um, but he believed in the necessity of abstract art as a means to resist the intrusion of politics and commerce into art. And I think this is a really important point, especially as we start to look towards pop art. Um, and he had a real distaste for pop art because he viewed it as attacking modernist traditions and the embrace of popular culture and, and the, the notion of reproduction, which we'll see in, in a bit. Um, and so there's Lee Krasner, right, seated nude. And we do have a little bit of representation here, right? We can actually see that there is, uh, when you see the title, you can start to really see the seated nude, right? You might have a figure kind of in this area and maybe some sort of a chair here, right? Um, so that'd be like representational abstract, right? Even though it's within kind of this abstract expressionist movement. And I apologize, this is not seated new here. And then city landscape, right? So we, we can see through the title, um, then we're able to kind of explore what representation may, there may be. Or not, right? In this case of untitled. In Peter Volke, so like I mentioned, we see uh, this way of working start to penetrate other mediums. And this is, this is a piece later in his career, um, frankly, that he may when he started needing to make some money, plates sell well, right? But we have, uh, um, he's kind of violated the plate in a way that it is no longer functional. We see the, the resemblance of a plate, but there's, you know, holes and, and gashes and, and sculptural elements. Um, in this, right. and this is uh, kind of more in the meat of when he was um, really just following, um, you know, what he like felt in the clay here. And we're gonna, we are gonna watch just a quick video so we can see his practice and um, and kind of his evolution as an artist as well. But when you think about post-war ceramics. There's one figure that comes to mind, and that's Peter Volkes. He was in the Air Force. He was a gunner on a plane. And I think when he came out, he had a chance with a GI Bill to actually do something. I think Pete never thought of not working with his hand. When I went to school, I studied painting. I, was, I wanted to be a painter. I was forced into a, doing a clay course, you know, to get out of school. So I took that class, and that completely changed my life right there. As soon as I started feeling that clay, that was a big change for me. I couldn't paint anymore. It was just gone completely. He first starts off with a really tight idea of what pottery is. He's making pots that we're familiar with, like well-crafted pots, well-designed pots. They look like the pots that we expect. 
but he starts pushing against those borders, he starts pushing against the conventions. In 53, he had an experience at Black Mountain College where he met John Cage, Rauschenberg, and other East Coast abstract expressionists who like blew his mind away. It was the first time I'd heard a poetry reading First time I'd seen uh, modern dance happen. So it was a big revelation to me. And my mouth was just open all the time. His experiences of war, his time in school to find the material he was always meant to work with, and the idea of furthering his mind intellectually allowed Volkus to set his work on a new path to think of his work not as functional anymore, but as sculptural. The whole idea of not just making a pot or a vase or a teapot was like incredible. You know, because suddenly you realize you could do anything. And that's what Pete's philosophy was. He cuts into them. He violates their vesselness, which is against the law in ceramics. And this body of work really upset the field. You were either on the functional end or are now on this revolutionary sculptural end. If people resist what I'm doing, I just, I just dwell on this stuff. You know, I said, this guy he isn't getting it, you know, and I, he resists it. And uh, that's all well and good to me because I don't expect to be understood at that, at that kind of level. When I first came to UC Berkeley and met Pete, he actually was not doing clay anymore. He was casting bronze. And every night we'd be casting till five in the morning. We understood each other. We didn't have to talk so much about stuff. Then he started making plate again to make money, basically, you know, because it's expensive to cast bronze. He took ceramics and he said, this is a material for personal expression. This is about wrestling with materials. And Volkus, in front of large classes and students, I mean, he just spread the gospel of what it was to attack a material and to make it your own. It was very physical when you were, I mean, it was like a boxer, you know, was ready, running, running on this thing, running around, and you would be without shirt on and slapping this thing and cutting. It's almost as if the process and the act of creating is the work. Peter Volkus came back in the war and changed what our idea of what ceramics is or what our idea of what craft could be and brought ceramics more into the realm of fine art. His work is the flesh made real. It's dynamic, it's powerful, it's fearless. It's fearless work. So Volkus is really significant because this is, you know, really the first time that ceramics is taken seriously in the fine art world, right? Um, and it, it, some of them may not be, you know, kind of what we think of as like an aesthetic object. We might, maybe some of us wouldn't want this in our house. Some of us would, right? Um, but I'd like to just invite us to think back to Dada, right? Some of us love Dada, some of us hate Dada, but what it did for the art world, right? It was a real kind of step into challenging what art was. And Volkus really challenged what the medium of ceramics could be, right? It's now he was using it just as another material um, to kind of make sculpture rather than it being um, strictly a, a process to make functional objects. 
And um, I know from seeing many um, you know, quizzes in this class and throughout the years that a lot of people really like Beth Kavner's work, right? And we can kind of thank, thank Focus um, for pushing ceramics into um, a more sculptural material. Um, where otherwise, you know, people like Beth Kavner might not you know, even exist today. So, um, you know, I like us to think about what similarities and what differences we see in aesthetic styles and techniques of these artists, right? Um, as we move into kind of color field painting. So uh, the tendency within abstract expression is distinct and gestural extraction or action painting, right? And it was um, kind of pioneered by some of the artists that we've seen. Um, but one thing I would like to point out is that Clifford still um, has a museum that is dedicated completely to his work and it's located right next to the Denver Art Museum. Um, if you're ever down there, um, it is worth popping into. You can see uh, you know, they have almost all of his work. I think they sold like five of his paintings to, to build the building. But other than that, um, all of his work is there because he ended up um, kind of rejecting institutions and, and keeping all of his work um, until uh, now it's displayed there. And you can see some of his writings as well, which are pretty interesting. Um, so, and, and I just kind of like this last little um, highlight, expressing a yearning and a transcendence uh, in the infinite. And so I'm kind of moving into some color field painting here. We're at Newman. Um, we saw this piece in particular um, used in a Andreas Gursky photograph earlier in the semester. And so these are entirely um, non-representational abstract pieces. When we still do have some some representation in the, in the movement itself. If you're only moved by color relationships, you're missing the point. I'm interested in expressing the big emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, says Rothko. These paintings, um, the style work in general, I feel like a lot of there might be some I can do that comments there. And um, I'll just kind of touch on that um, just after we watch this. You see a painting of a hazy rectangle of color stacked on top of another hazy rectangle of color and you think to yourself, oh right, Rothko, I know that guy. But do you know that guy? Why those hazy rectangles? And why should I care? This is the case for Mark Rothko. Marcus Rothkowitz was born in 1903 to a Jewish family in Davinsk, Russia. They immigrated to Portland, Oregon in 1913, but his father died just months after. Marcus was a good student and won a scholarship to Yale, where he did well and discovered his leftist political leanings, but he dropped out in his second year and moved to New York. It was there he set his mind to becoming an artist and studied at the Art Students League under Max Weber and learned about Cubism and Matisse and the German Expressionists. In the 1930s, he made paintings influenced by Milton Avery and Matisse. He changed his name to Rothko in 1940, and by the mid 40s was trying out a little surrealism with works like this and this that drew from classical myths, tapping them as symbols to discuss human tragedy. He also copied Juan Moreau a bit by making pieces like this and Max Ernst a bit with pieces like this. He and his buddy Adolf Gottlieb were reading a bunch of Nietzsche and Jung at the time and thinking about the unconscious. With fascism rampant in Europe and World War II underway, Rothko and other artists at the time thought that following artistic traditions was not only irrelevant but irresponsible. He and Gottlieb wrote a letter to the New York Times in June of 1940 saying, there is no such thing as good painting about nothing. We favor the simple expression of complex thought. Rothko wanted to answer the big questions, and he was trying to find his own way to do that. Large, flat, misty areas of color started appearing in his paintings. The works became more and more reduced and simplified and geometric until he went completely abstract in 1947. By 1950, he had found his jam, and then he just kept on doing it. At the time, Rothko's paintings were utterly new. Before then, color was usually tied to narrative 
content. But Rothko was asking color alone to draw out emotion. Yes, he did basically the same thing again and again from 1949 until his death in 1970. But for him, it was an extremely useful and seemingly inexhaustible structure within which he said he could deal with human emotion, with the human drama, as much as I could possibly experience it. He said this style offered him the elimination of all obstacles between the painter and the idea, and between the idea and the observer. By getting rid of anything that triggered history or memory or narrative or even geometry, he was trying to create an overwhelming sensory experience for the viewer through monumentality, simplicity, and stillness. Many have described standing before a Rothko as a religious experience. He would layer glazes of color to build hues so deep and rich that they seemed to glow, something Renaissance artists like Titian and Giorgione also did to great effect. The symmetry of Rothko's work also connects it to religious painting. Collector Dominique de Menil said Rothko's paintings evoke the tragic mystery of our perishable condition, the silence of God, the unbearable silence of God. In 1964, de Menil and her husband John commissioned Rothko to paint a set of murals for an octagonal chapel in Houston, Texas, which you can visit today. The murals are somber, using dark maroon, purplish red, and black. With these, he wanted to create a sense of enclosure and a space for meditation. Rothko was a deeply troubled and depressive man. He took his work very seriously and spent a great deal of time and focus and angst in creating each of them. In 1958, he was asked to create a set of murals for the Four Seasons restaurant in the new Seagram building in New York, calling it a place where the richest bastards in New York will come to feed and show off. He set to his task using a dark palette and planned for the enormous paintings to hang oppressively overhead, wanting to make the viewers feel they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. But he eventually decided to hold back the paintings and instead gave them to the Tate in 1969, where they still hang today. Rothko strictly controlled the environment of his paintings, demanding they be shown in low light, in groups, encountered at close quarters, and never mixed with work by other artists. He did this not to be difficult, but because he cared deeply that you have an immersive, transcendent experience. You're not looking at the paintings, you're with them and within them. More than anything, Rothko wanted to make you feel something, to encounter the undefinable, to stare into the void, to confront universal human tragedy. This isn't painting about nothing, it's painting about everything. So hopefully that kind of helps you see inside of the mind of Rothko and um, the time period a little bit to maybe suspend a little bit of that. I could do that or what's so great about these pieces and, and really, um, you know, ask, uh, you know, yourself what you can find in them. And one thing I will say is um, they kind of touched on the glazes, um, the layer after layer kind of create like a really rich color and that is all really completely lost when you're looking at them on a screen um, whether it's a projector or your computer or maybe even your phone right now and if you ever get the chance to see one in person i just uh, ask that you try to get you know relatively close to it so that everything else um, in your field of vision is lost and you're really only looking at um, these pieces as a color field and um, just kind of invite your mind to wander. Um, I think that's, that would be kind of the ideal way to experience one of these pieces. And um, maybe one day you'll have a chance to go to this, the Rothko Chapel. I've heard that almost every religion has um, held some sort of service in this space. So that's kind of an interesting testament as well. Um, so kind of moving into pop art now. It's a movement that emerged in the 1950s and flourished in the 60s in America and Britain. That's kind of important. So they drew inspiration um, from popular culture um, and, and commercial culture, right? So without further ado, we'll kind of start um, digging in. Rauschenberg is, is one of the kind of godfathers of this uh, um, movement. non-traditional materials, right? Collage, we have to see a little Dada-esque um, way of working here, but using a lot of images that are pulled from popular culture. We're just kind of paying attention to similar similarities and differences here in the work for the moment. The influence of Axe Brat 
abstract expressionism as well. Mm. So just some kind of characteristics that um, we really need to be uh, mindful of when we're looking at pop art. So it's popular, right? it's designed for mass audiences, um, transient, expendable, right? usually forgotten, short-term solutions. Um, it's low cost, it's mass produced, it's aimed at the youth, it's witty, it's gimmicky, it's glamorous, it's big business. And we'll really see this um, in some of the later artists and uh, Andy Warhol really kind of loved this point. This is Andy Warhol, and this is a can of soup. These are screen prints of cans of soup by Andy Warhol. This is pop art. Pop art began in the mid-1950s, when artists started making art inspired by Hollywood movies, advertising, pop music, and comic books. There were two types of pop art. Pop art made in America about America. Pop art made in Britain about America. Pop artists in America made art about what it was like to live the American dream. Andy Warhol began his career in advertising before realizing that he could screen print pictures of soup cans and Coca-Cola onto canvases and sell them in the same way advertisers sell real soup cans and real Coca-Cola. He wore a silver wig, lived in a silver factory in New York, and hung out with groovy kids like Gerard Malanga, Nico, Lou Reed, and Edie Sedgwick. She also had silver hair. He said in the future, everyone would be famous for 15 minutes. He liked fame, he liked money, he made art about both. Other pop artists like Roy Lichtenstein painted the world as a comic strip. This painting is called Poin. Lichtenstein was imitating the industrial techniques of mass production in the same way as mechanical reproduction had imitated the techniques of artists. It was called Parody. This is a sculpture by Klaus Oldenburg. He blew up everyday objects to monumental proportions in an attempt to question what constitutes an iconic image in a modern society which embraces disposable mass-produced items. Now let's look at British pop art. This is Great Britain after the Second World War. It looks as drab as a post-war Russian book. This is America after the Second World War. It looks like Disneyland. Artists in Britain began making art about America's vibrant and aspirational can-do culture. It was witty, whimsical, and sometimes ironic. This is a collage by Richard Hamilton. It confronts the mass advertising coming to Britain from America. Here is Peter Blake. He painted pinup girls and wrestlers. Here he is wearing American jeans and holding a magazine all about Elvis Presley. He's showing the influence American culture is having on Britain. Love the badges, Peter. David Hockney, who is from Bradford, moved to Los Angeles for the American name style. Here is his swimming pool. And here is his palm tree. It's much sunnier in LA than it is in Bradford. Not everyone liked pop art. The art historian, Janet Greenberg, said it was superficial. Andy Warhol, agreed and responded by saying he was a deeply superficial person. In fact, Pop had found new subject matter in mass production and had developed new ways of presenting it, like comic strips and screen prints. As Andy Warhol explained, once you got Pop, you could never see a sign the same way again. And once you thought Pop, you could never see America the same way again. Right. 
know, it's a, I think it's kind of a fun video, a little explanation in the history of pop art, and um, really kind of seeing that um, pop art was happening, yes, in the United States, about the United States, but also um, the influence the United States was having on, on Britain right, and how those artists were responding as well. Um, and I just want us to really think about how pop art is fundamentally different from abstract expressionism. All right, so um, pop art was painting something that was, you know, record easily recognizable, whereas uh, abstract expressionists um, were trying hard to um, not represent anything at all, right? Um, and it's kind of an interesting um, comparison correlation when you see that pop art really kind of grew out of abstract expressionism. And just like you to think about why those differences are important as we're um, looking at this work. So. Ed Ruchat, uh someone who's still still working today. Um, right, and uh, he really comments on the myths of the American romanticism, commercial culture, urban life, and uh, with humorous and iconic, ironic phrases. And he also really used some um, odd materials, right? So we're still kind of pushing the... Um, the limits of what art can be made out of at this time. Right? So this one, he's got right, maple syrup. Right? He, he even had a series where he was like um, putting grass stains on, on some of his work. Pay nothing until April, right? So he's really got the, the parody down, right? Like some of the other pop artists of the time. Here we go. Coffee, egg white, mustard, chili sauce, ketchup, and cheddar cheese on canvas. Kind of wild. And then a uh, favorite Liechtenstein. Mm. Real comic style. Modernist critics were horrified by pop artists, right? The use of such low subject matter, like uh, Lichtenstein's comics and by and, and kind of pop culture, right? By their apparently uncritical treatment of it, right? How could this be celebrated? In fact, both pop, in fact, pop both took art in new areas of subject matter and developed new ways of presenting it in art and can be seen as one of the first manifestos of postmodernism. Um, just to kind of think back at uh, Dada Surrealist as kind of manifesto um, born art movements, right? And there we have Wham, which they touched on. Moving into some Klaus Aldenberg. Right, so he's the one that's really kind of celebrating the, what the, he kind of called the mundane objects um, and, and, and kind of questioning what we celebrate in a con commercial society where things are kind of easily um, consumed and then thrown aside. And he takes these small things and blows them up on a monumental scale. Kind of looked at this work in terms of mass earlier in the semester. And just one more reminder on the British versus American pop art. So early pop art in Britain was fueled by American popular culture, viewed from a distance while American artists were inspired by what they saw and experienced within that culture. Not to say that, um, you know, British artists weren't seeing and experiencing of that culture, but it was um, from a distance, right? And here's a Richard Hamilton piece, which they left a little closer at. Looking at the role of American society in Britain. Mm. 
strong use of collage as well, right? Maybe thanking Dada a little bit for that. While still kind of having bold colors and shapes, reminiscent of pop art. And then David Hockney. Um, we looked at him a little bit uh, this semester, the lawn, bring, lawn being sprinkled piece, but he was really kind of you know, one of the taglines that explains his work, I, guess, I should say, is it's Frank mundane realism. Right? And we can kind of see that here. It's just really kind of frankly represented, right? the representation of there. And he, his work has evolved over time. He's an artist, he's still working today. He's getting up there in age. Um, but we have a you know, really kind of um, like intentionally flat representation. Right? And maybe that's a little bit of a um, you know, parody on uh, these collectors, right? Some newer work. And uh, one fairly recent here. And then Peter Blake, he was the one that had that self portrait, right? Um, with all the things like adorning himself of American culture. Here it is. Levi, I mean, what's more American than some Levi denim, right? And he also did uh, this album cover, and he also did a couple for The Who as well. Have a nice day, Mr. Hockney. <laughs> All right, so obviously our, our, uh, our spotlight's got to be Andy Warhol. We'll just flash through a few, uh, quite a few of his pieces and watch a quick video. Um, but I think this quote is really fantastic by Warhol. What's great about this country is that Americans started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same thing as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see a Coca-Cola. You know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think, you can drink a Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. All right, so he really loves these kind of mundane, kind of um, iconic uh, things in American culture. And we've talked about this one as well. Um, and, and he, you know, he's surprisingly uh, con conceptual in the way that he thinks about his pop art as we see this. Um, the Maryland diptych and the, all the Maryland pieces that he used um, were uh, the photo. This is the last approved photo that she released before her death. And what is further interesting about Warhol is that he actually won a contest for the best um, drawn portrait of Marilyn Monroe. But what he's using is this mass-produced image of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and Warhol was also a very devout man, very religious guy. And um, we kind of see this um, in the way that he depicts Marilyn in, in this work in particular with this gold background, it kind of, um, you know, harps back on, on this Byzantine style with the gold background, the Virgin Mary. And he's really suggesting um, that pop culture is stealing the spotlight, so to speak, right? And we've talked about this piece in terms of the hair and the eyeliner. It's all printed over a black and white. It's not the best quality of a piece, right? Um, but it, it talks about the glamour that Monroe had been thrust into and um, her ultimate demise um, with uh, kind of a, a fairly tragic overdose, right? And we'll just kind of pop through a few here as well before we um, see a video about Warhol and his work. Andy Warhol by Andy Warhol, but he also did a lot of um, photos of celebrities, portraits rather.
we'll look at uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat later in the semester in the street art section. We all know Mick Jagger, right? The Rolling Stones. We'll see a few more. The great Muhammad Ali, the rope of dope, flow like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Andy Warhol was the most glamorous figure of 20th century American art. Born in Pennsylvania in 1928 to Czech parents, he lived most of his life in New York. Much about his life was eccentric. He wore a silver wig. He liked to go to the dry cleaners and stand in the corner, enjoying the smells and sounds of the chemicals and cleaning machines. He loved airports and used to go through airport security multiple times just because he said he found it fascinating and kind of inspiring. Andy Warhol's great achievement was to develop a generous and helpful view of two major forces in modern society, commerce and celebrity. He spent most of his life as an international celebrity, but he was also very keen on business. There are four big ideas behind Andy Warhol's work, which can teach us a more inspired way of looking at the world and prompt us to build a better society. We spend too much of our life wanting something better and extraordinary. It's normal to feel that the exciting things are not where we are. Andy Warhol aims to remedy this by getting us to look again at things in everyday life. He performed his magic most famously on soup cans. Putting them on the wall and looking at them helps us to see their beauty, to notice their appealing labels, their strong but elegant forms, perfectly fitted to their uses. In the same spirit of redirecting our attention, Andy Warhol made a video of himself eating a hamburger. During the 1960s, Warhol groomed a retinue of bohemian and countercultural eccentrics, to whom he gave the title Superstars, including Nice, Joe D'Alessandro, Edie Sedgwick, Viva, Ultraviolet, Holly Woodlawn, Jackie Curtis, and Candy Darling. Warhol understood that celebrities have an important power. They can distribute glamour and prestige. He thought that glamour needed to be redistributed in such a way that society could work better. For example, he suggested that the President of the United States could use his status to shift perceptions. As he wrote, if the President would go into a public bathroom in the Capitol and have the TV cameras film him, cleaning the toilets and saying, well, why not? Someone's got to do it. Then that would do so much for the morale of people who do the wonderful job of keeping the toilets clean. He didn't call his place in New York a studio the prestigious term used by artists since the Renaissance to describe their place of work. Instead, he called it the factory. We tend to feel that the idea of art and the idea of a factory don't really mix. But Warhol's point was that business and art actually do very much belong together. As he wrote, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. During the hippie era, people put down the idea of business. They'd say money is bad and working is bad. But making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. The lesson of the factory is that we can organize ourselves to produce good things more reliably and cheaply. One example of this for Warhol was Coke. He pointed out that wherever in the world you go, Coke is always the same and is always quite nice. Art has generally not been able to live up to this ideal of being good and widely distributed. Artists make a few things, but only a few people ever get to own them. Warhol tried to counteract this. One day, after reading that Picasso had made 4,000 masterpieces in his lifetime, Warhol set out to make 4,000 prints in one day. As it turned out, it took him one month to make 500. The lesson we can draw from Warhol is that mass production needs to apply beyond making prints and other kinds of high art. We need the organizing, commoditizing, and branding powers of business to reliably produce and distribute the good things in life, like high quality childcare, psychotherapy, career advice, and beautiful architecture, just to start the list. Most art doesn't have much of an impact on the world, but Warhol was extremely keen on large-scale impact. He mastered many genres, from drawing, painting, and printing, to photography, audio recording, sculpture, and theater. He started a magazine, designed clothes, managed a band, made 60 films, and had plans to start his own TV chat show. 
Warhol was able to extend his work into different channels, partly because of his populism. Being a populist meant that he was unafraid to reach people where they started. The chat show is a quintessential populist medium because it plays to what masses of people find funny and interesting. Warhol was a populist out of generosity. He wanted to translate the things he cared about, like sensitivity, a love of glamour and spectacle and playfulness, into objects and experiences that could touch many, many people. The only pity is that he never quite finished what he did. He could have founded his planned TV chat show, then gone on in ever broader and broader partnerships to start a fashion label, design a hotel, maybe a financial advisory service, a supermarket chain or an airport. This is the task still open to people who are drawn to art, but also want to change the world. Andy Warhol died in 1987 when he was only 58 after complications following routine gallbladder surgery in a New York hospital. He is buried at a small cemetery near where he was born in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. His example is still an invitation to us to change the world in a mass populist way through art. Um, my name is Andy Warhol and uh, I just finished eating uh, a hamburger. <laughs>